fifty percent of people are below average in, in anything by definition. Mm. And um, you know, I, I don't I don't know that you know some of the social media platforms or you know the entertainment of our day doesn't uh, reward long term thinking. Mm, definitely you know, not. <laughs> <laughs> people are trained to have a, a lower and lower attention span and be focused on you know immediate results. Or if they can't be a millionaire this weekend, then they don't want to try. Right. Wherever you guys are watching this show, I would truly appreciate it if you follow or subscribe. It helps a lot with the algorithm. It helps us get bigger and better guests, and it helps us grow the team. Truly means a lot. Thank you guys for supporting, and here's the episode. All right, guys, we got Derek Moneyberg here today, fresh off the gym, coming up with the bling. Thanks for coming, man. How you doing? Good. Sorry, right what you been working on lately? You've been kind of in the shadows a bit, right? Shadows? Uh, I don't know. I've been working on uh, my business, working on... Uh, finance and you know, f perpetually for my whole life and uh, you know kind of hobbies I, I have a do a lot of MMA training mm -hmm. uh, lift some weights and it's kind of it. my friends ask me oh what's new what's new? nothing I just do the same things repetitively same old same old I like it that way and you're speaking after this somewhere right yeah I have a negotiation conference in town this weekend so four days about uh, negotiation and uh, you know optimizing you know whether, whether you're an employee and you know you need to I think, yeah, I'm curious your opinion on it, but I think like any employee, mm -hmm. if you had a job, but if you're a good negotiator, you could at least, if you're thinking entrepreneurially and negotiating well, you could double, triple your salary over time easy enough. Right. And, and if you want to be an entrepreneur, then you have to be a decent negotiator. It's a rare skill these days to have <sighs> negotiation skills. I had Chris Voss on the show and he, he was an expert negotiator and, you know, he doesn't bring emotions into his negotiations, which, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. Do you take that approach as well? I mean, you, you have to have enough, you know, emotion to, to say, you know, empathy or to understand what is the other person's situation. I think a lot of people really mistake ne negotiation where they're like, negotiation means uh, to beat the hell out of your opponent right, right. and take everything you can and, and screw them in some way. And I think the most valuable negotiations are not these, you know, one-off transactional adversarial circumstances, but, you know, long-term mutually beneficial relationships. So if you could uh, bring a lot of value to somebody's life over time, um, and don't waste your time with people that don't reciprocate. But mm. if you can have, you know, valuable reciprocal relationships, like, why do you want to be, you know, overly aggressive with those people? Like, you know, I want the other person to win because over time we're both going to win, you know? Yeah, I like that approach, the win-win mentality, right? Rather than just trying to take everything you can from someone. It's very short-sighted, but most people are. Yeah, it is interesting why most people are. Why do you think they are like that? 50% of people are below average in, in anything, by definition. Mm. And... um you know, I, I don't. I don't know that you know some of the social media platforms or you know the entertainment of our day doesn't uh, reward long-term thinking. Mm, definitely so, not. <laughs> <laughs> people are trained to have a, a lower and lower attention span and be focused on you know immediate results. Or if they can't be a millionaire this weekend, then they don't want to try. Right. And I was actually I was talking about this at my conference last night that uh, a guy named Greg Jackson was on stage with me. Greg Jackson is a MMA coach, is one of the best coaches in the world. Mm. Uh, He's a coach for John Jones, George nice. St. Pierre, Holly Holm, and 20 other champions. And, um, yeah, we were, we were talking about the same thing that, you know, it takes years to get great results at something. Like if you want to be really good at something and mm -hmm. have like a differentiated skill set that you can capitalize on long term, like it takes years and years to do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a person that wants to make, he made a comment, said, well, if you want to make a million dollars overnight, <laughs> you know, you're not going to do that. And I'm like, actually I did. And. I showed him the stock market. Yesterday I was up uh, 260 something thousand, and the day before I was up 760,000. Wow. So I'm like, well, I did make a million dollars overnight <laughs> just now, but it took me 30 years of prep to do that. Right. And if you don't want to do the prep and you don't want to do the little boring, nerdy things, then how would you do that? Yeah, it is a childish way of thinking about it. Also, a million dollars isn't what it used to be, too. I say that all the time. Like, you can't live off that these days. You can buy a great parking spot in Hong Kong. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah, it's really nothing. I mean, I just did this calculator where it shows you how much money you need to make in order to like retire. And they're saying the average person needs $30 million now with inflation factored into it. Inflation's gonna be a lot higher in our lifetime than it has been historically. So the, the second half of my life, I expect inflation to be much higher than the first half. Wow, that's scary. And inflation's so bad that and people don't, in, in, inflation is a tax on stupid people. Inflation is another, an additional tax that, on, inflation only comes from one place, there's only, one group of people that can print money, hmm. and that's the government. Right. So they, when the government says inflation came from anywhere else, it's <laughs> it's beyond nonsensical. Yeah. Like the only people you have a monopoly on the currency, 
So if there's inflation, it came from the government printing extra currency or Federal Reserve Bank uh, expanding their balance sheet, et cetera. They call quantitative easing. And, you know, the, this uh, never happened before um, 1913. And, you know, in the, in the past 110 years, uh, the currency has been devalued 98%. Mm, so damn. if you were a millionaire at that time, so people use the term millionaire like it means something. Yeah. And, you know, a millionaire 100 years, 110 years ago, that was, you know, significant wealth. And today you'd have to have $50 million to have the equivalent spending power that a millionaire did a bit over 100 years ago. Wow, that is crazy. And that's not like a guesstimate. Like, that's that's the math. That's the math with inflation, 98%. So yeah. why why before 1913 was there no inflation, you think? Well, you, you still had the, a gold standard. This is even before the Bretton Woods Act. But um, you know, you, that's when the Federal Reserve Bank was formed, where you could start playing games with the currencies and mm. and creating inflation. Dang, so it's all manipulated. I wonder if this happens in every country. It happens in every failing country. <laughs> Well, over the history of time, every currency has failed other than gold, right? Yeah. So that's pretty yeah, concerning. I agree. So that means a dollar one day might fail. Will. You think so? I think you just said it pretty clearly that historically that um, that's been the pattern 100% of the time. And I wouldn't expect it to be any different. Right. Why are we why are we engaging in behaviors that are more responsible than other countries did? Or why, why would it be different here? Yeah. There's all sorts of like absurdities that we do with the currency here. Yeah, you saw the new plan Biden uh, announced. He has a plan. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. One point five trillion dollar loan or something. I, I don't know this one. So yeah, they just spend a hundred. They spend a trillion every hundred days now. So <laughs> I, I don't know what this trillion's for. That's crazy, man. So that being said, how much of your wealth do you store in just physical fiat currency? Uh, very little, a few hundred thousand. Okay, I like to have a few hundred thousand in cash laying around, but. Um, and I think if you have more than that, it doesn't make sense. I'd rather have assets. Hmm. I like infrastructure assets. So real estate, stocks, companies? Uh, mostly stocks. I love, you know, I managed real estate. I had my own properties for a long time. I still own you know, several properties. But as far as rental properties, um, you know, it's good business if you're starting off, if you need to make your, you know, your first million or first few million. Like, that's cool. Right. Um, long term, it's really a quite an annoying grind to manage rental properties. I've heard. And um, people idealize that, like, oh, it's just free cash flow. You can just, you can just rent the house, and the rent just comes. And they don't understand all the human things that go with that, mm. and you know, and governmental things as well. Of, uh, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, or different code things, or you know, which some of them are make good sense, and some of them are nonsensical. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, th that's a great way to get started with some money. But you know, if you have a decent chunk of money, I think the stock market's amazing. I love the stock market. Mm. And how is someone like you able to crush the stock market? Because 80% of the stocks are owned by five companies, right? Five hedge funds. Um, you're not, you're not going to have an advantage overnight and like, you know, uh, alg algorithms or, you know, I'm not going to write better code than those funds can hire the, the best PhDs and the best computer scientists in the world mm -hmm. to, to create whatever algorithm they want to. So as far as, you know, when I hear somebody say they're going to be a day trader, I just think, oh, you're, you, you want to be bankrupt. Like, <laughs> I understand. Um, but you know, usually those people are very committed to their bankruptcy. So yeah, okay. Um, I just think longer term. It's kind of what we said a few minutes ago. I was like, well, what's out of favor right now that's likely to be you know considerably valuable in the future, right? And you see things that are you know in twenty twenty you could buy. There's a lot of energy companies that were you know ten percent, seven percent of what they're currently trading for, twenty five percent. You know things that had wonderful balance sheets that are twenty five percent what they're currently trading for. And you know, when you do you think energy is going to be popular in the future? Do you think people will like electricity? Probably. I think it'll remain popular. <laughs> so I, I like to buy very boring things that uh, you know, in two or three or four or five years are probably going to be worth a lot more money. Got it. Did you catch the Nvidia wave? Uh, I don't care about whatever the next trendy thing is. Really? Nvidia popped off, man. No, AI. It's, it's up twenty x. Yeah. Did you see AI coming at all? Are you interested in coming on the Digital Social Hour podcast as a guest? We'll click the application link below in the description of this video. We are always looking for cool stories, cool entrepreneurs to talk to about business and life. Click the application link below and here's the episode, guys. Paul? I'm not a tech nerd, no. Okay. So you just stick to what you know. Yeah. Which is great advice, I'd say. Worked out pretty good for Warren Buffett. Yeah. Doing okay for me so far. Yeah, because you're at the point now where you don't need to chase crazy risk return ratios. I think what I'm doing is less risky than it's a lot less risky than holding cash. Yeah, if you hold cash, you're for sure you're losing money with the inflation that we talked about. 
And um, if you buy an index, then you're guaranteed an average return. Mm. If you buy an S&P, you know, ETF or something like that. And um, I, I bought uh, Class A malls, I buy high quality real estate through the stock market, through REITs, real estate investment trusts. Mm. Um, I buy boring things like Macy's or Kohl's or Nordstrom when they were beat up. And um, you know, I, I made a lot of money doing little things like that or energy stocks. Nice. Nice. But, yeah, I think people overcomplicate uh, making money and they do a lot of analysis and read the news and all this stuff. But you're keeping it simple, which I like. I spent nine years in university. So I went to University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, was the number one ranked graduate school for business in our country. Mm. So I can do all the nerd analysis, but you know, you can't do math better than the computer can. Right. The, you know, I can do math very well, extremely well, but my classmates can too. Mm. So, you know, and the computers can too. So I just don't think you have an advantage there. Like you, it's important to understand to to be able to read financial statements. If right. you can't read the financial statements, you don't know what's happening. Mm. But then you also have to think about human behavior. Like, well, how are the crazy humans likely to behave over time? Right. And you know, where is the mispricing? You know, between um, you know asset fundamentals and human behavior. You know, you could buy Macy's a few years ago, in 2020. You could buy Macy's for. Four dollars and fifty cents, hmm. and it was trading for twenty-three percent of their you know, book value of what the assets were worth. And anyway, I did the math. I'm like, what? if you pay twenty-three cents on the dollar, most of their portfolio is real estate. Hmm. So if you said the brand name was worth nothing, if you looked at their credit card company, if you looked at their, uh, they have a beauty line called uh, Blue Mercury, and if you looked at their primary asset was their real estate. If you looked at those assets and you thought the brand name was worth nothing, which is silly because it's the number 10 retail website in the country at that time, um, you, you buy it for 23 cents on the dollar. Hmm. And, you know, it's gone up considerably since then. It's up over 400% since then. Wow. Interesting pick because a lot of people uh, thought retail was going away. I, I don't believe that. You don't believe shopping malls will go away? Do you think that shopping was uh, going to fall out if it, women won't go shopping in the future? Definitely not. <laughs> I think women are going shopping. Yeah, I think women are going to spend all of their disposable money and uh, you know retail of various kinds, you know, shopping and entertainment. And uh, historically, they just tend to get some subsidies from men and spend some of that money too. Oh, so yeah, they get a lot from men. Yeah, yeah, you think? Yeah, <laughs> you got kids? No, that's not for me. No, interesting. I like business more than kids. Wow. So you chose business over family? Um, uh, yeah, I guess. Wow. So what do you think of the? That balance, though, like a lot of people recommend, just balancing that instead of going all in on one or the other. I mean, yeah, if you want to, if you want to be poor, I think balance is a great idea. <laughs> Interesting, but a lot of top. Let me kick back at this because a lot of top entrepreneurs do have a, a woman. Well, I mean, I have a long-term girlfriend. Okay, you just didn't want kids. Yeah. Okay, fair. Interesting. I don't know. I think I want kids, man. Um, I didn't tell anybody else to not have kids. I just said it's not for me. Yeah. Was that? From like early age, you always wanted that decision, or it kind of you know, changed. I never had that calling. I just I never felt. Uh, um, yeah, it's not for me. I like to travel. I like to have my freedom to to do the things I want to do. Mm. Um, I, I don't want to. It, it sounds like hell to me to have uh, you know, a kid squawking and get to wake up and take care of it. So uh, yeah, yeah. a lot of people like that, and that's great. And I hope they're happy with it. And uh, it's just not for me. I feel that now. Growing up, I know you had a pretty pretty poor upbringing right uh yeah i didn't have the best mother she was not very attentive maybe that's my decision to not have kids mm. mom, mom wasn't very attentive could be some uh, trauma there man we got to dive into this uh, i'll play around with it <laughs> um you know dad wasn't there much and then uh he went to prison for a lot of my childhood for drug trafficking wow so um yeah i didn't have a you know i, I kind of was in charge of the house or took care of myself since i was 10 mm. or so and um yeah, so I got, became a good problem solver because of that. That helped with a lot of things that made my it really sucked at the time. Right. But a lot of things uh, that helped make my life good later. Mm. Um, so it's not at all a bad experience. But, uh, you know, there's plenty of people. Everybody's got a sad story about something. So yeah, yeah. I don't think it's mine so, you know, special or unique. But, uh, yeah, I think there, there's plenty of things at the time that were unpleasant. Um that later on, you know, that some of the problem solving, you know, things that I developed or, you know, awareness about human behavior, things like that, it mm. helped me an awful lot in business later. So you had to grow up very quick. Interesting. Yeah, that, that definitely played a role in your mindset. Of course. So did you want to go to college? Because you said you went for nine years. Yeah, I went to, well, you know, I was high school dropout and then I went to community college 
Mm -hmm. then I got a scholarship, a 50% scholarship to go to a good private school to finish my bachelor's degree. And I, I hang, hung out there for a lot longer than I needed to because they gave me a four-year scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I'm a nerdy guy, so I'm happy to take extra classes and uh, play around with that. And, um, and then later I went to graduate school for MBA. Okay. Now I feel like there's a new narrative for people my age about college. How do you mm. feel about people not wanting to go? You know, I, I used to think that was ridiculous. I used to think it was a terrible idea. And when I look at it today, and you know, I'm not politically correct at all. I think it's uh, for extraordinarily naive or low IQ individuals. And um, you know, when I when I see the things that are, you know, that I, I, had, I had to I hesitate to say being taught, you know, but the things that people are learning in college today mm. is so much of it is so useless or even <laughs> counterproductive. So you know, when I went to school, there was still I'm, I'm old enough that um, you know, a university was a place that you went where smart people congregate, congregated to share intelligent ideas and mm. argue a bit and look for like, you know, a, a truth or a better way or a better path, you know? Right, like a mastermind. Yeah, and now it's a place where dumb people go to get dumber. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think I'd go to college today. Wow, what do you think changed within, because this is only 30, 40 year period, it's not like it's... I'm not that f***ing old. <laughs> it's maybe 20, 30, <laughs> my bad. I'm 44. <laughs> okay, so 20. <laughs> 20 year period um no i mean i, I think the um there's a, there's an extreme bias and the people that are you know are supposedly educating young people and uh you know the this political correct stuff is just nonsense it's mm. if anybody that that values you know political correctness over factual correctness deserves the terrible outcomes they're about to experience in life so when you when you turn that university experience into um you know, you're not allowed to say this, you're not allowed to think that, uh, versus, you know, it should be a place for open thought and open discussion. Yeah. I saw on Patrick Bet David's show, I think he said almost 100% of education is owned by the left. Yeah. It, Which, I mean, it, it's so bad that, um, yeah, you know, you, I, I mean, I'm not a Republican, but I'd say I'm, you know, financially conservative. I'd say I'm very socially liberal in the sense that I don't give a what people do, like pursue your happiness, yeah. enjoy your life. I don't care what people do. Uh, but don't ask me to pay the bill for their mistakes, you know? Mm. I don't think you and I should have to pay the bill for other people's mistakes. Right. And I don't think they owe me anything either. Nobody owes me a cell phone. Nobody owes me rent. Nobody owes me medical care. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody owes me anything. But I also don't think I owe them anything. Right. So you're a believer, just get your own. Yeah. Yeah, yeah have your talent, get your own. That's what a competent person should do. <laughs> a respectable person should do. Yeah. No, I agree. I don't like when I'm leeching off people. It feels, feels like I didn't deserve it almost. They don't deserve it. Yeah. And when you have an ethos of people that are very undeserving and try to rationalize, you know, why they deserve your wealth, why they deserve your hard work mm. is, is um, it's literally a, a, a philosophy of slavery that you and I are supposed to work hard and then give the, you know, our earnings to someone who doesn't deserve it. Right. 50% like, of our earnings. Yeah. More in some states. Yeah. Cali, 60% plus New York. It is pretty wild. And then you see where it goes to and you're like, what the hell? I never complain about taxes. Um, I don't mind paying for things like infrastructure, military, police. Um, I kind of like the idea that, you know, the U.S. has the best military in the world. Mm. So I, I like that. I don't mind paying my portion of that. No problem. But, you know, to your point that some of the spending is so absurd is for things that, like, no, no one would do this with their own money. Right. No one would do this with their own money. Yeah, I wish you could kind of choose where it went to, like maybe a category at least, you know. I've had that thought at different times, and I don't, I don't know that it works, you know. Well, you know, it, it would work in the sense that you and I are thinking of it, that some, some absurd programs just simply wouldn't be funded because no one would donate money to do those things. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. There's a lot of those programs right now. On your website, it says financial success is a lifestyle choice. It is a lifestyle choice to become smarter and work harder and... I mean, the only way to get ahead of life is you're, you're going to have to be smarter or harder working than your competition, hopefully both. Mm. So I do think it's a lifestyle choice. I think, I think millionaire, as we discussed, a million dollars isn't what it used to be. But, you know, being a millionaire in a first world country is absolutely a lifestyle choice. Right. And being poor is also a lifestyle choice. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think people would get offended by that quote, but I think it makes sense. You know, I don't give a shit what those people think. Cause they, don't, <laughs> they don't they don't think much at all, actually. Yeah, there's a lot of programming, right? A lot of bots right now. People a person just, who would argue with that statement is quite literally doesn't think much at all. They mm. must have, you know, very little faith in their competency. It's the group of people that we were just talking about that that think that, um, you know, 
someone who's industrious and productive and works hard is somehow bad. Right. And I owe them health care or something. Yeah. No, no, I don't. And a lot of that is programmed. You know, I, I agree. And, you know, um, a lot of public school systems or you, know, you mentioned uh, leftist programs and universities. And that starts, you know, through the public school systems. The unions control a lot of that. And there's a lot of, um, you know, communication in that vein that, um, you know, welfare is good and, it's, you know, somebody somebody else should be paying for your expenses in life. It's like, you know, come on, man. Yeah, they teach you some wild stuff. I was taught by my accountant to contribute to my IRA, which is useless. It pretty much is, yeah. Can't touch it till 65. By the time inflation kicks in, that money is worthless. I have very little money in, you know, those type of retirement accounts. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Why would you lock up your money for 40, 50 years? And so, you know, you have the traditional, I'm, I have IRAs, I don't have 401k, but I have, uh, you know, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, and I have the you know, same opinion about it, that if that's what you're relying on is your whatever six or seven thousand dollars a year that you can contribute and grow over time if that's what you're relying on for your retirement you're gonna have a very sad retirement yeah for sure did you ever have a nine to five job growing up i quit my last job in january 1999 i was mm. a, a lowly manager at walmart walmart i was 19 years old uh managing walmart employees wow and uh i didn't think that was my best opportunity in my life <laughs> In this January, 2024, um, I needed an excuse to buy a Rolls Royce. So mm. I, I kind of always wanted one. And I thought that's a not a good reason, but a but a fun excuse to, I'm like, well, let me go buy a custom Phantom and the extended one with a, a lot of customization. So yeah. I spent uh, 800000 on a car to Holy. celebrate my 25th year of unemployment. Wow. I didn't know they went up that much. Yeah, I just bought a G-Wagon last December, just same reason, a little tax write-off. Mm. But yeah, I was never uh, too materialistic. I definitely went through a watch phase, but watches, you could argue, are an asset. Yeah, I mean, you can sell a watch and make a profit on it, probably. Yeah, but there is that retail. allure that a lot of people fall into with materialistic cars and objects, you know. Live whatever life you want. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think the most important thing that money buys is your freedom. You don't have to spend time with people you don't want to. Mm. You don't have to... Um, agree with nonsensical arguments from people that you don't want to. Right. If you if you showed up to your, your job and, um, you know, if you don't have much savings or much wealth, then, you know, maybe you're going to go along with whatever your employer says, like, all right, you know, Bob now identifies as Susan. You're going to call Bob Susan from now on hmm. and, and use, you know, preposterous pronouns. Now, I don't care if Bob wants to change his name to Susan. Cool. I might even call Bob Susan. I'm like, all right, your name's Susan now. I'm probably not going to hang out with that person. But like, <laughs> all right, Susan, peace. Bye. But I'm not going to agree to say these, you know, ridiculous pronouns and, and I'm not and engage in a delusion of like, you know, she, her. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you have enough money, you don't have to participate in that nonsense. Right. And you know, they say, we're going to cancel you. We're going to this, that. We're going to throttle your accounts. We're going to cancel you. It's like, you. Yeah. Well, as a boss, they're making requirements. You have to hire certain genders and races and all this if you're a public company. I just think it's ridiculous. Like, yeah. How about hire the best people so like the, the doors don't fall off the jets? Agreed. And how that's why I'll never want to go public no matter what I do. Yeah, It's not worth it. I'm not in a position where I'm growing a company that would be a public company, but um, I've built good lifestyle companies, have very good income from that. Uh, if I didn't have that, I'd have a great income for my investments. I don't have to do anything if I don't want to. Mm. But uh, I still, I, I like solving puzzles and solving problems, and uh, I like helping my clients a lot. So nice. I really enjoy what I do. But you know, I, I would just revert back to what we said about you know wealth creation. Is like more than you know. I have a Maybach. I have a the Rolls Royce is coming in a few months. It's, yeah, it takes uh, six to eight months to Damn. to deliver. They said. Um, but I, I don't care about material stuff so much, you know. But live, live comfortably. But the most important thing is your freedom. That you don't have to participate in somebody else's delusions. You don't have to. Um, you can spend your time as you wish. You know, mm. if you want to go travel somewhere, you could go travel somewhere. Right. Stay in a nice place. Feel pretty comfortable. So after relieving Walmart, how long did it take you to achieve what you consider freedom? Oh, it's you know only fifteen years or so. Oh, okay. So it was a grind. <laughs> yeah. I um, thought it'd be quicker than that. 
Um, I had a, I had my first million dollars when I was 29, just after my 29th birthday. Okay. And you, you know, with inflation, you know, then that's I don't know, maybe that's 1.5 or 1.6 million today or something. Yeah. Um, and then in my early 30s, I, you know, 32, 33, that was about four million. And then yeah, it was kind of a slow grind to, to about 11. And then uh, 2020 recession happened, and mm-hmm. I got to to multiply it that nicely, you know, through the hysteria of 2020, 2021. Mm. And um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of people that are richer than me. Most of them are older than me, but you know, I'm in, I'm in the 70s right now, and I have 100 million in, in my 40s still, I would think. And, uh, I'm, and and again, I, I'm not telling somebody else you you have to be a millionaire, you have to be rich. It's like, be poor if you want to. But I've just said it's a lifestyle choice. Mm. That was the original question that you you mentioned. It's like, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to go make a uh, hundred million. It's probably an effort most people don't want to make. That's yep. fine. But you know, make enough money that you're you're actually happy with your life, and you know, only rich people can afford groceries now. <laughs> so for real, when I go to Whole Foods now, it's like three hundred bucks. Everything's three hundred bucks. <laughs> That's not like a big shot. When I was a kid, which, you know, which was only forty years ago, it's not so old. But when I was a kid, a hundred dollars was like a, a huge shopping cart of food. You oh, know? I bet at Costco you could do a lot with a hundred back in the day. Yeah, and now you know, a hundred dollars is like uh, you could go to Costco and buy like a filet mignon, you know, <laughs> like a a long piece of five yeah. pounds of filet mignon or something. That's crazy. And nothing you, else. And you can't even trust certain groceries with the quality of food these days, too. I bought uh, I bought a bunch of crab legs. And it was quite a lot. It was it was you know a bit ridiculous. But we bought about fifty pounds of crab, and about a hundred pounds of meat. And it was over five thousand dollars from Costco. Yeah, Holy it's just one crap. shopping cart. I mean, it's all full premium stuff. It's yeah, like, yeah. you know, nice king filet crab, yeah. and the big king crab and uh, nice ribeye steak. So it's all premium stuff, but you know, uh, it's over five thousand dollars <laughs> with checks. That is crazy, man. One shopping cart. I kind of did that just to make the point of like, you know, if you fill the shopping cart with premium stuff, it's kind of expensive. Yeah, no, it's it's a shame. You gotta have money to eat healthy these days in America, at least. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty wild. In Europe, you can eat a lot better. I, I like Europe because the food quality is actually good, and you can eat the pasta and not feel heavy. Hmm. Do you travel a lot right now? Um, I have in the past. I've been to over sixty countries and flew, I don't know, a little over two million miles. Nice. So, I used to fly internationally quite a lot and spend five, six months a year in other countries. Hmm. Um, I've been spending more time domestic. I, I go to Europe once in a while still, but. I don't. I don't hate it, but kind of. I wanted to be in more better fitness routines for yeah. like MMA training and weightlifting, and you know, if you're changing time zones week after week after week, mm. it's a lot more difficult to do that. Can't be Vegas for fight training. Yeah, I have a lot of friends over here that are fighters, and I have a. I built my own gym that uh, a lot of them come to train with me in Chicago as well, mm. and we have a studio and gym over there. Nice. So, so are you f- looking to fight, or are you just? No, I'm 44, man. I'll be 45 soon. But Tyson's fighting. W- I don't want to say anything negative about Mike. So. <laughs> Tyson's getting a good paycheck. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Mike out. Tyson. Good for you, Mike. So you just do it more just as a health holistic thing to stay in shape? I mean, I, I train like a pro fighter and I train with a bunch of pro fighters. I train like a pro fighter, mm. but uh, it's not a career. Like, even there, you don't make that much money doing it. Yeah. Unless you're John Jones, you're not really making millions like that. Very few fighters. No, that's true. I was, I was with his coach last night. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, John can, you know, John's. 24 or 25 and oh basically I mean, he lost he lost one fight technically but he yeah. knocked the guy unconscious yeah. and then was disqualified for like an <laughs> illegal strike so you know i i think of him as being undefeated mm-hmm. and um you know yeah if you're if you're the best fighter in the world ever you know, john jones then mm-hmm. you know then maybe you can demand uh 10 million or something for a fight yeah dana white has him as the goat do you consider him the goat as well i, I do i think it's hard to argue differently yeah i have him as mine too i mean some people say could be but I think John's beaten tougher opponents. I've met Khabib. And I know his manager well. Khabib's a nice man. I have nothing negative to say about him, but um, I, I don't think he's done what John Jones has done. Hmm. Agreed. You interview a lot of fighters on your show, right? Yeah, I've done quite a few. What drew you to the fight world so heavily? You know, it's the last group of people that aren't fully hmm. It's the last group of people that are they're very performance-minded. They have to be honest with themselves. You know, it's an individual sport. It's not like a, a team sport. Right. So you have to go in the in a cage and um, um, do some very tough things that are you know it's not enough to be like a tough person psychologically tough physically tough you know by the time you've done enough training for ten or twenty years to have a, a very high level skill set you know you have injuries that accumulate over time etc hmm. and um, you don't get to get, go in there and make excuses you know you're yeah just, you're in there by yourself and uh, outcomes are very clear 
and um, people that make a lot of excuses don't fight at the highest levels, you know. For sure. Yeah, you got to take accountability, which is something people are la seem to lack these days. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think there's people, not the, you could say plenty of things about amateur fighters or lower level, you know, people that made it to the UFC and they're going to have two or four fights and yep. then they're going to go manage a Denny's or whatever it might be. Um, but the people that made it to the higher levels there and stuck around for, you know, 10 years or something, those are, those are people that are, have high level of personal responsibility and accountability. They're very reliable. They tend to keep their word consistently and uh, have a, a lot of friends that are that, that way that I have a lot of respect for those people. Ali, uh, have you met McGregor yet? Well, you know, there's a conflict there that uh, a guy named Pauli Malinaji was my boxing coach for, uh, I don't know, 14 months or so. Mm -hmm. And they have a significant beef with one another. Really? So I've, I've been offered two and a half times to interview McGregor and... Uh, uh, I don't. I don't need to spend time with my friends' enemies. Wow, so you're very loyal. I am. Okay, that's a good skill. Dana's known for being loyal as well. I have nothing personally against McGregor. I, was, you know, I have nothing bad to say about the guy, but um, great marketer. Yeah, made a lot of money over there. Great marketer. Um, but it's, yeah, we just have a conflict that way. So. Yeah, I think he's fighting Chandler. I don't know if they announced it yet. Um, Chandler coming up. I know Mike Chandler. I've trained with him, um, done interviews with him. He stayed with me. He's a good man. Nice. Who do you got winning that fight if it happens? No, it could go either way. It could go either way. The, you know, the Chandler is going to be, uh, he hasn't fought for a couple of years by that time. And uh, he trains hard. I'm sure, you know, I hope Connor is training hard. I'm sure he is. He looks pretty fit. So, yeah. Uh, it could go either way. It's going to be an exciting fight. They're, they're both pretty, you know, action oriented people. Uh, both tend to, you know, use a lot of energy in the first couple of rounds and right. get exhausted later. So, uh, um, you know, probably probably won't go to decision. Good. I hope not. Probably won't go to I decision. I want to see it done quick. Any up-and-coming fighters you got your eye on that you think can really take it off? Oh, um, I'll give a shout-out to the homie Brendan Allen. He's a young guy still in his 20s. That uh, I think he's got a main event coming up. What is that? This weekend he's got a main event in Atlantic City. Mm. So, uh, I, mean, I mean, no, that's not true. That's... Uh, that's next week. It's a Apex next week. Okay. Next week in Las Vegas. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's he maybe ranked number 10 right now or something like that at 185, but he's doing very well and has mm. good momentum and has the right type of mindset or personality to, to perform well. Nice. I've been keeping my eye, eye on uh, Sean O'Malley. Hmm. I saw him climb the ranks, and he's number one now. What do you think of him? I don't much. Um, I went to his fight in Miami. Uh, he beat Cheeto. Um I think he's very talented. I, I don't like his outward persona. Mm. Uh, I'm not a fan of his outward persona. But I, but I think behind the scenes, I, I think he's a lot more hardworking and um, um, you know responsible and respectable than than his outward persona suggests. You, you wouldn't be able to get those results without you know being very consistent and and diligent and intelligent in the background right so yeah. i think that's mostly an outward marketing thing that he's doing i think so too i think he followed uh connor's path a little bit you know that wild side i could see that you know the, the brash rat brothers there's a couple of kids out here that uh they came from london i think they came from they came from middle eastern country pakistan or afghanistan first and then they were in london for some time those guys work really hard mm. they're smart they work hard they pay attention to detail i think they're going to do very well cool keep an eye on them ufc 300 coming up will you be there no, I won't. Went to the last four weeks. I've been at the fights, and I got a couple other obligations the next couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, anything else you got coming up? Anything you want to promote or close off with? Um. Yeah, I think for you know, there's an introductory program they have called the Ten Commandments of Wealth. If somebody's serious about you know, understanding the just good basic fundamentals to uh, uh, go from being an employee to an entrepreneur, and maybe entrepreneur to investor. That'd be a great place to get started. Just check out my YouTube channel. See what's uh, going on YouTube or Instagram. And um, plenty of little entertaining clips in there that uh, also are informative and can help somebody, you know, orient in the right direction to do a bit better for themselves. Perfect. To choose prosperity over poverty. Love it. We'll link it below. Thanks for coming on, man. Take care. Yeah, thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.